much. Thank you very much, Sarah, members of the head table, board of directors, and <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. I know this is the annual convention of ADC, and I, <coughs> I know that after the dinner, they're, they're going to try to uh, expand your contributions uh, in time and money uh, to their cause of human rights and, uh, <coughs> and civil liberties. I know that uh, there are many more uh, young people from Arab American heritage who want to work in this area, then there are opportunities. And whenever uh, you're asked to, to contribute or your friends, relatives, co-workers are asked, just keep in mind that out there, uh, they're the leaders of the future who want to do this kind of work as they are in smaller numbers on the staff uh, of ADC. And that's building for the next, uh, <coughs> the next generation. I'm amazed at how this number keeps increasing year to year when there are so few professional opportunities to work full time in this area. Needless to say, the demand uh, for justice here is enormous. There is an ex extraordinary range of malicious prosecution operating from our government still against uh, uh, charities, against uh, people who have different sounding last names, there's a breakdown uh, often in law enforcement where people are uh, profiled and uh, thrown in jail without uh, charges. Um, the, the process continues not to ennoble our highest pretensions as a society uh, where you're innocent until you're proved guilty, and that means before trial, contrary to some judges, the concept of innocent until you're proved guilty, doesn't just start with the trial. It starts with whether you're going to be thrown in jail without any charges and kept from having legal counsel and mistreated in jail. There's also uh, an enormous suppression, uh, let's call it a penumbra from the hard cases of free speech. Lots of self-censorship is going on in this community and that spells fear. Uh, that spells an uh, uh, a inability to fulfill life's possibilities. And while we should focus on the cases and the brave defense counsel uh, and trying to uh, change the, uh, the laws here and the way they are enforced, we always have to keep in mind the intangibles and the lost opportunities uh, and the withdrawals from public arena and civ civic practice and politics because of this fear. And uh, fear uh, is a function uh, of abuse of law. It's a function of bigotry. It's a function of a whole range of uh, propaganda results about um, what's going on here in the Middle East and elsewhere. And I'd like to uh, start by pointing out uh, a half a dozen taboos which reflect the powerlessness of well-intentioned people uh, who want uh, to provide a broader range of practical civil rights and civil liberties, and not just to Arab Americans, but also to the whole range of people who are uh, discriminated against and repressed. Because every generation in our history, somebody inadvertently is chosen uh, to lead and further advances uh, in civil liberty protection, civil rights protection. In the past, it was other immigrant groups, and now it's Arab Americans and Muslim Americans because of all the conditions that we know. And so in fighting for uh, these rights, you're also fighting for the rights uh, of all people. Taboos are more than just literary uh, phenomena. Uh, taboos are sort of the litmus paper test of powerlessness on one side and excessive power on the other. And <coughs> if we are going to uh, develop uh, the kind of access uh, to Congress, uh, to the executive branch, uh, to the courts, uh, to the forms of public decision making, we have to recognize these taboos for what they are 
and consciously try to overcome them very, very specifically and met meticulously. So here are the six taboos, and I'm sure you could add more yourself. The first one is the congressional taboo, which Congressman Moran knows about very well. Uh, Congress actually is a forum where there is far less freedom to discuss the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, obviously, than, than the Knesset. Uh, Congress, in uh, 62 years, has never had a congressional hearing where the invitees are Israeli and Palestinian peace advocates. And as we know, the Israeli and Palestinian peace advocates represent people with very prominent backgrounds. The Israeli peace advocates come from the diplomatic corps, ministries of justice, the Knesset, the military, the national security, mayors, intellectuals, writers, authors, artists. And what they're advocating, such as a two-state solution and other rights in that area, is roughly supported by half of the Israeli population, and maybe more in moments of calm, and maybe less in moments of tension. <clears throat> but they are not people who are speaking for a tiny, tiny percentage of people. <clears throat> they have never been invited to testify for Congress. The power of AIPAC is such that it even can keep prominent Israeli advocates of, of a peaceful settlement of this conflict from being heard in Congress. And I hope, Congress Moran, that you will combine with some of your uh, colleagues there to see how soon this can happen. These are very articulate people, and they deserve a hearing, along with their Palestinian counterpart. The congressional taboo tells us that the people who are saying after this latest attack on the Mamara that the tide is turning. The tide may be turning in world public opinion, even U.S. public opinion. <clears throat> it is not turning in Congress until we see one or more of the members of Congress begin to stand up for the national security interests of the United States and the people in that region of the world. <clears throat> People don't know that uh, two years ago, a comprehensive poll of the Israeli people, sponsored by Haaretz and a university affiliate, came down with over 60% of the people in Israel want negotiations with Hamas, over 60%, 28% opposed. <clears throat> when Mubarak Awad went to that area some years ago, uh, to start a nonviolent uh, civil resistance effort. He was instantly deported by the Israeli authorities. So you can see that there are anomalies here uh, across the board, and they need to be fully discussed where the media was mo will more likely cover, which is a, a congressional hearing. Taboo number two is why does this country continue to give economic aid to one of the most prosperous countries in the world, a technological, economic, and military juggernaut called the State of Israel. In fact, <clears throat> in fact, <clears throat> they have social services that people in this country are deprived of. They have universal health insurance, for example. Maybe they should give aid to us. Uh, the aid level, <clears throat> the aid level, is quite remarkable, in the sense, uh, it's not quite sure how much it is apart from military aid. But military aid now is two ways in terms of technological transfers between Israel and the United States. But <clears throat> the the amount of Economic aid is really a complex process. In fact, Senator James Ab Jim Aberesk asked the General Accounting Office in the late 70s uh, to put out the one and only report on this, and it was this thick. That's how many ways aid 
is transferred